I'd like to invite you all to observe and think and listen with me as I present fragments and pieces of material that we've been collecting over a period of five to 10 years and collating in various forms such as publications, films, exhibitions and, um, and talks. It is well known that Saul Pleike was one of the first public intellectuals to document the effects of disposition through his book, Native Life in South Africa. He moved through South Africa, Southern Africa, and visited both the urban and the most remote areas on what he called tours of observation. There is a period film called Come See the Bioscope, which is a fictional depiction of him played by actor Ernest Ndlovu, moving through the country and noting down in a large notebook what he sees, the aftermath of the 1913 Native Land Act. In one of the scenes, he stops his car and is greeted by a local boy. Their interaction is friendly and brief. Plyke asks for directions. The boy, Musi, is curious about the car and asks for a ride. Then Plyke picks a flower from the ground, but before he places it into a large book, the boy asks him, what will you do with that flower? While writing down some notes, Plyke answers that he's keeping a record of everything that he sees. He then hands the boy a magnifying glass and invites him to look with him. One understands from this scene, as directed by Lance Herbert, that the book that Plyke is writing are the notes towards native life in South Africa. So this lecture borrows from a particular chapter in this book called, Pray That Your Flight Be Not In Winter. It is a biblical line um, and it is essentially a very particular description of what Plyke sees during his tour of observation. I'm going to just do a few readings from a few, a few lines from, um, from that particular chapter and describe the kind of um, you know, observations that Plyke makes. Pray that your flight be not in winter, said Jesus Christ. But it was only in the it was only in during the winter of 1913 that the full significance of this New Testament passage was revealed to us. We left Kimberley by the early morning train during the first week in July on a tour of observation regarding the operation of the Native Land Act, and we arrived in Blumo in Transvaal about noon. So he then goes on to describe the, rap the rapid force and the, um, the, 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 the fast way that the, the Land Act has been already been enacted. Um, by the time that Plyke and his party um, carries their tour of observation, the new law has just been passed in Parliament, but the effects were already seen on, on the land. It's about 10 a.m. when we landed at the south back of the Val River, upon whose banks a hundred miles farther, we, farther west, we spent the best and happiest days of our boyhood. It was interesting to walk on one portion of the banks of the beautiful river, a portion which we had traversed, except as an, which we had never traversed, except as an infant in mother's arms more than 30 years before. So the first stop that they make is um, along the banks of the Val River. And in this particular description, the landscape takes Plyke and his party and um, the rest of the, the people on the tour back to a particular childhood of abundance where they would um, have abundance of time to play, abundance of food, abundance of space, and um, it, it, it evokes a happiness in him. So there's a nostalgic there's a nostalgia for a happy and safe childhood, but he also observes certain ecological and climate changes that um, marks the interventions of infrastructure and records the consequence of time and delay because of the ecological situation. 
At the time that Plyke was um, traversing the Vaal River, there were various infrastructures such as railways and, um, and bridges that were not there during his boyhood. Further on during this tour, he also um, describes how they meet people along the way. And their tour becomes not just a, um, a description, but it also becomes a way of counseling people that they meet along the way. But there's one moment during this chapter where Plyke actually describes a physical pain that he suffers. And I'm just going to read it for you. At this, this time, we felt something rising from our heels along our back, gripping us in a spasm as we were cycling long, a needle-like pang, too, pierced our heart with a sharp thrill. What was it? We remember feeling something nearly like it when our father died 18 years ago. But at that time, our physical organs were fresh and grief was easily thrown in our tears. But then we lived in a happy South Africa that was full of pleasant anticipations and now, what changes for the worst we have gone. So here we find a description of a feeling while cycling through the landscape of extreme distress because of the dispossession that they are witnessing. The feelings are described as a physical pain felt collectively, similar to the loss of a parent. Yet worse, since the situation and environment was able to console some of the pain um, that they previously um, uh, that they previously felt when, when they lost their father. The journey that Plyke went on was also a journey of meditation. It was a thought process and an observation. It was a record keeping process, but it was also a research process. They were gathering material in order to appeal to um, the British powers in London in order to reverse this particular law. I encourage um, people to read this chapter because um, it is really a kind of a sense of record keeping of emotions and record keeping of an array of emotions. But towards the end of this chapter, um, Plyke describes that it, it was heart rending, heart rending to listen to the tales of cruel experiences derived from the rigor of the Native Lands Act, Land Act and offers and offers um, counseling to those that may need it. The story of Kobadi and the family um, that experiences the death of an infant along the way is particularly haunting. The, the young wandering family decided to dig a grave under cover of the darkness that night when no one was looking. And at that crude manner, the dead child was interred and inter interred amid trembling, fear and trembling, as well as the throbs of torturing anguish, the stolen grave, lest the proprietor of the spot of any of his ser servants should surprise them in the act. We only meet the fugitives, the Hobadi family, in the last three pages of the chapter. It is as if Plyke is trying to reach a crescendo or climax in his description of the cold brutality of the plague law with the retelling of his experience with his family and the loss, not only of their land, but also of their young child. So what, what I'm concerned with in the work that I'm doing is just to perform the kind of, um, or to sort of, you know, um, pay homage to uh, what Plyke and others did because the kind of destruction and the kind of cold cruelty um, is still an ongoing um, unfolding catastrophe in South Africa and in many other countries where dispossession is um, currently unfolding. Together with that, we're also concerned with the potential of paying attention to the emotional landscape for a renewed spatial practice. If we are serious about an emancipatory spatial practice, then one must also pay co close attention to the structures of feeling. Taking account and making records is one way to pay attention to it 
and in that way begin to immerse ourselves in the complexity and the range of the emotional landscape and of course to embrace its tensions. This is a clip of a um, forced removal that occurred in 1977. Um, and I'll just uh, play this for everybody. <laughs> Under police supervision, those who did think they had somewhere to go loaded up their stuff onto the trucks, taking with them the corrugated iron that until the day before had served as their sole shelter and protection from the wettest Cape Town winter on record. So why are the shanties being pulled down now? And what had prompted this action? Brigadier Vesthazer, chairman of the Question Bantu Administration why, uh, Board, why claimed it was a job that was long overdue because it has been postponed for a very, very long time. And at the moment, conditions were becoming desperate because people were coming in at the rate of about 2,000 per month into these squatter camps. And they are growing at such a rate that we cannot delay it anymore without risking the whole situation to get out of hand, entirely out of hand. But why now? It's midwinter now, it's rain, it's cold. These people are almost destitute, aren't they? I beg to differ, it's not midwinter. It's already spring, and during the days that we were working there, the days were quite hot. The no, climate was hot. But those who stand huddled by the roadside in winter clothes don't see it that way. Where are they going to make new houses? No! No, we keep it, I mean, they take it just here.
the neighborhood that you saw being destroyed in the first clip occurred in the winter of August 1977, a month before um, the death of Steve Biko. Mannenberg was recorded three years prior to, to that occurrence. Mannenberg is a township that was established for people that were moved out of the center of city and it was composed by Abdullah Ibrahim and um, performed originally with um, Basil Mannenberg could see who himself was from Mannenberg. The person that you see on the cover is a woman called Gladys Williams, who was a domestic worker working for one of the musicians um, in the band. And Abdullah Ibrahim um, wanted initially to call the album after her, and it was um, it was decided that it should rather be Mannenberg, where it is where it's happening. But this we it's it's well known that this is, this became a very iconic. Um, piece of music to think through the, the specialities of um, the disposition of people. Nearly 65, 70, 65 to uh, 60, almost 70 years after the two of observations that saw Plyke um, and his party went on in 1913. So what do we, how do we use the music? How do we, um, move through the tensions that um, Dollar Brand and, um, and others begin to um, embrace when we're thinking about, about um, the history of, of, of land in South Africa. It is extremely ironic that um, Brigadier van der Veste of Peasant begins to deny the weather um, in, in a report around, around um, in, 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 when the reporters asking for an account or for an explanation of why they've chosen one of the coldest winters to move people in that way. Um, it points to a kind of a blunting of the emotions, which was the title of um, Favut's thesis, um, Favut being one of the main archi architects of the apartheid regime. It, it, it points to the fact that you know somebody could disassociate so completely to the cruelty that is happening under under their command that they could actually deny the weather, deny the fact that it's cold and that it's not yet spring. But these kinds of um, denials or disassociation is very evident in the kind of way space is made in South Africa. Um, I'm just showing um, showing you a slide of a photograph a, a photograph of a scene where David Jack, um, an architect that has received a gold medal for architecture in South Africa and also behind um, the development of the waterfront, where he's pointing to the layout of Mitchell's Plain to a group of people that would assume um, we assuming that they would be the beneficiaries of this new housing, which is a housing designed to separate people racialized as colored during the time. So in this image, it, it kind of depicts this kind of sort of disassociation, scientific laying out and the kind of, a, um, you know, uh, how easy it is to disengage in conversation around, around space. My father grew up in one of these, um, my father grew up in a neighborhood in Stellenbosch where it was very much integrated into the fabric of the city, integrated in terms of um, religion, economics, as, as well as um, various backgrounds and various people um, living in a kind of creolized situation. He often went to this bicycle called um, the Gaiety Bicycle, which was literally across the road from where he grew up in his grandmother's, um, in his grandmother's house. And, you know, the Gaiety had a very important, um, spatially important, um, you know, uh, moment for him. And I grew up with stories of him going to the Bicycle and escaping, essentially, 
the cruel regime and the cruel um, situation that um, was being, uh, you know, forced upon him as a young black person in, in, in living in South Africa in the 1950s and 60s. Um, but one story in particular that he often shared was that he wanted to see the, um, the opera La Bohème, which was being advertised at the white cinema in, in the center of town. And he was desperate to see it at the Gaiety because often what would happen, they would advertise the movie at the, at the white cinema. And then two weeks later, it would arrive at the Gaiety um, because cinemas were separated as well under the Separate Amenities Act. But he found out quite soon that he won't be able to see um, the opera um, and he had a massive crush on the lead singer Maria Callas and he convinced his friend Leonard um, Biscom to um, sneak him into the plaza theater where it was meant to be where it was screened so in his my father's words that um, the plaza was for white cinema goers but the projectionists were allowed to be black so he, he then um, pretended to be um, Leonard's assistant and was able to, to watch, to watch the, the production. For him, it was, it was, a, it was quite a, um, a moment in his life to disobey the apartheid laws. Um, and he writes about it in the publication that we ended up publishing for pamphlet called Gaiety. And for the, few, for the few months of 2017, I worked with my father to shape this set of memories into a public event. His memories were of an earthquake in 1969, his first experience of viewing La Bohème, as I've um, just explained, and as well the destruction of the neighborhood defluctor where he grew up. The music of the opera was projected from the car audio systems um, as provided by the Klutisville Car Audio Sound, um, Sound Club. And the visuals were project projected onto, the, onto, a, onto a curtain where the gaiety once stood. The gaiety bioscope is central to his recollections. And our event took place on the um, 30th of March, 2017, opposite Roman's Pizza, pizza Shop in Andringa Strad Banuk, Banuk Road. Just before the screening, um, my father took everybody on a tour of where the neighborhood once stood. And um, I witnessed a coming together of people that once lived in this neighborhood. My father made a point of naming everybody that used to live there. Um, there is a film on YouTube that you can watch to see the reenactment of this performance. So, one of the things that Plyke also did was to move through Southern Africa as a whole. Um, he moved up to what was then called the Bechuana land, which is today Botswana. And um, the, but the South African born Botswana writer, Bessie Head, found um, Saul Plyke's work when she was trying to research how people lost the land in Southern Africa. And to find Plyke's work was a revelation for her um, in such a way that she describes native life as a kind of missing link in the kind of history of the specialities of Southern Africa. She wrote the foreword of um, Native Life, a republication in 1982, and she describes the book as a um, text of flaming beauty. I got interested in Bessie Head by um, the fact that I was um, made aware that her house in Seroe was a national heritage site. And I googled the plan that you see in front of you, um, which was drawn up by a friend of hers, Tom Holzinger, who is one of the main characters, if you read Question of Power, he is in Question of Power. She, he drew up this plan from memory. 
But this house was uh, Bessie Head's house from 1969 up until 1989 when she um, transitioned to, um, to um, the next life. What you see on the screen is a very humble three, three roomed house with a bathroom. But for me, what struck me as an architect is that I've never encountered a plan where the first room that you enter into is the kitchen. The way I experienced the house that my grandmother was moved to in Stellenbosch was through the kitchen, but the kitchen was always entered at the back. People that were familiar, family and friends, close friends would use the, you would use the kitchen as the entrance. But others like priests or um, you know, people that were not familiar to the family, new visitors, they had to enter from the front door and into the front room, which was always very formally prepared with gladiolus flowers on the, um, on, on the, on the front room, on the front table and family pictures, brasso and all the kind of ornaments that display a respectable um, life and a respectable family. But Bessie Head's house, you don't enter from into a formal dining room or a sitting room, you enter straight into the kitchen. And I found this a very intriguing disruption in the kind of conception of how we conceive of space. I've since come, went on a kind of a thought path of including, of including Bessie Head and her work as an architect very squarely into the kind of uh, rethinking of um, spatial practice because from the outside, this house looks very similar or looks very the same as all the 51 stroke nine council houses that were being um, built for people that were being moved to Mannenberg, to Google, to, to Ocean View, to, um, to Clutisville. But once you enter, you realize that this is a complete new and creative, um, uh, you know, disruption. But coupled with um, coupled with a with a house is also a an impressive garden. So Bessie Head, um, from accounts that I've heard from a, from friends and from um, reading um, her literature, she was a prolific gardener. She wrote letters to Robert Zabukwe, the Pan-African leader, and the exchanges was just about gardening. She didn't consider herself a commercial gardener, as Robert Zabukwe was, um, a, a, in some ways, tried to sell um, sell some of the the produce that he was that he was making that he was growing. Um, so they exchanged on on that on on that level. Um, she was also part of a collective called the Boiteko Collective, where um, the aim was to grow food for communal use. And in also the sub aim was to make friends, to make a com community. And she made her, one of the best friends um, through this communal activity, a woman called Vesele Sienana, who ended up being such a close confidant of Bessie Heads that she um, led um, Bessie Heads funeral in 1986. And um, as we know, such a lead role in an in African family is um, signifies that this person is a significant family member. So the garden becomes a site where deep friendships were made, where somebody like Bessie Head, who moved to um, Botswana, on an exit permit from South Africa. So she applied for a job in Botswana, moving from District 6, Peter Maritzburg, um, and she was not allowed a, um, a visa or a passport that meant she could return to South Africa. They said that if she wants to leave the country, she will have to um, accept an exit permit, which means she cannot come back. So she arrives in Botswana as a refugee from South Africa, apartheid South Africa, and she begins to write. She begins to write uh, letters, and she begins this. Um, she begins to construct this archive that we are now sitting with, and that we can begin to meditate and think through the life of Bessie Head, the gardening practice, and so on. The house itself is called Rain Clouds, and um, it's named after when rain clouds gather, which was the novel that she was able to make 
enough money to construct this house. These are images that I found at the Kama Third Memorial Museum in Serowe, which is a kind of house of Bessie Head's archive, her letters, photographs, um, anything to do with, with her and, um, and her work. I've included in this lecture a letter that she wrote to Alice Walker, um, where they're exchanging uh, thoughts, where she's exchanging thoughts um, to Alice Walker about a new book called Revolutionary Petunias. Um, maybe I'll just quickly read some of it. I don't know when these notes are ever going to get done as every now and then I have to stop ty typing and go and lie down on the floor prostrate with worship. This often happens when one encounters a kindred soul, as in the ordinary life is indeed lonely. I have to spend a lot of time trying to avoid exhausting myself with people who say, but I don't understand a word you say, when all you are saying really is that life is bigger and more beautiful than the narrow world each individual is trapped in. One would keep on saying that it doesn't hurt, but I have been feeling it, mostly due to that novel of mine, A Question of Power, which draws a lot of shitty comments and people who write delightfully trying, telling me that they have aesthetic backgrounds. And the source of my insanity is my rough, crude slum background. It is one thing to disdain to reply and another to receive confirmation from some source that one's learning, one's eyes are quite right and sane. I really like, I really like, I really think um, Bessie Head's um, letters are extraordinary because it shows a character of a woman that is just completely badass and completely complex and completely um, just a, a full, um, it just the letters just gives a kind of a full description of the range that was Bessie Head. Image of her um, collecting seeds and, um, you know, uh, it was known that she was experimental in the way she she gardened. But this is a very particular image of her in the garden with her mother, her foster mother in Peter Maritzburg that I found and was quite moved by. And our project was really extended around trying to collect and expand on this archive that we've inherited from her and from Seroe and from um, the Kama Museum, collect plant material from um, areas where she would have been in Cape Town or from forced removal sites in Cape Town. Um, and also looking at the photographs very closely to see the kind of clothing that she wore. She often wore floral clothing um and identifying it and then um you know collecting it as part of our archive it becomes another object when we begin to construct imagery or construct collages of um, the garden this is a image of Bessie head and Bosele Sienana in the garden in Siroe um, around some of the fragments and um, and material that we found the name Blumhoff comes up quite often in this archive. So Blumhoff Community Center, where some of these images came from, is um, where Bessie Head um, met her husband. Blumhoff is the first visit that, first place that um, Saul Pleike and his um, party arrived to during the, during the trip. And Bloom is, um, Bloom Street, is the place where Manenberg was um, recorded in Cape Town in 1974. For those who don't um, understand Afrikaans, but bloom essentially means flower in Afrikaans. We also had a um, need to interact with um, children. I, I needed to sort of share this archive and share this these stories with children and we had a, a day of meditation around her work. And um, um, I worked with a group of kids, three of them, my own kids, um, to try to just, you know, produce another garden with, with art materials that we, that, we, um, that we had found. 
some of these materials, some of the methodologies really begin to percolate the design process. How does one begin to make space? Bessie Head was a spatial practitioner. She thought about space very hard. She thought about the ethics of space. She made space um, through the house and the garden. But she also described interior spaces very particularly in her book, in her books, um, particularly Question of Power, where she describes this room um, that she um, was very fond of. And we wanted to construct, construct a space in um, the Chicago Architecture Biennial where all these um, methods and methodologies could be interacted with. Um, by the public. So there you see a, the conversation space that we, that we constructed. Um, the pamphlet is available to browse through the film and as well as the, the wall is um, covered in some of the material, plant material that we gathered. But more importantly is um, this image that was um, taken by Heinrich um, at the Chicago Architecture Biennial captures a very particular exchange between the work that we're doing in South Africa with the work that the Rewak Foundation is doing in Palestine, where um, similar things have been happening over time and similar, similar spatial catastrophes and violences are enacted on a daily basis, as we are all aware of. So for us, it was very powerful that this moment occurred um, between ourselves and the Rewak um, Architecture Foundation in um, in, in Ramallah. I'm just going to um, allow you just to think through um, some of these uh, ideas that we that we putting that I'm putting out there in terms of how how does how does you know how do we begin to think through the um, notion of gathering of collecting of of of, of conversation as extending an archive and extending the work that people do. And, um, you know, how do we begin to um, string together a whole range of conversations to begin to understand the, the, the power of, um, of the, the emotional charge that landscapes can, can give us. So, Another project that begins to also think through um, some of this is again closer to home in Simonstown in South Africa. Uh, I've spoken about observing um, observing saw Plyke and how Bessie Head observes um, Plyke and extends the work and how then we begin to observe others like, for instance, um, the painter Gladys Nguntlandlo and the poet Gladys Thomas. But before I begin to talk about those two figures, um, the story about this project is a story about myself and an artist called Kimang Waleuleri, who came across an image of this settlement in Simonstown called Luyolo. And when we came across this, um, this image, um, I certainly realized that I've never um, heard about this, this place. Luyolo was a, um, a a, a settlement in Cape Town that was um, started um, for the purposes of housing workers, particularly black workers, black um, migrant workers from the Eastern Cape. Um, they were people that were descended from slaves, enslaved people um, from, um, in, uh, from um, Indonesia that stayed in this place. Um, and there were also others from um, as far as West Africa, um, Sierra Leone in particular, fishermen that used to come and work in Simonstown. So Loyola was another one of those um, settlements that had a extremely complex, creolized um, and um, uh, larger than life presence in Cape Town. But for some reason, the entire settlement was erased in 1961, um, quite early on in the kind of um, series of um, constructions that we saw in Cape Town. And we wondered about this and we went and we um, looked at the, at the place and we um, found that only um, the terraces remain. And when we just scratched the surface of the, of the, um, of the soil, we found some kitchen implements, we found um, 
you know, the residue of domestic life still present in 2016 when we went. So our conversations as, um, as a group took us to the work of Gladys and Gund Landlo, who was a painter from Rugeletu, who did this painting called Houses in 1962. Um, it is not, of course, uh, clear, or we don't know whether this particular painting was done of Loyolo, but it could very well be. Um, we don't have uh, absolute evidence of it, but you know, these houses are on a hill. It was done in 1962. Loyola was um, destroyed in 1961. And somebody like Gladys Ngundlandlu would have been acutely aware of the kind of um, politics of, of, of land and the moving of people. So our, um, our exchange was around this idea of um, melancholia and anger. And it then took us to the, um, the exchange between two poets, um, Gladys Thomas and James Matthews, who produced a poetry anthology called Cry Rage. Cry Rage was um, published in 1962, and shortly after it was published, it became one of the first book of poetries in South Africa that was banned uh, by the apartheid state for being subversive um, literature. So Cry Rage becomes a kind of a, um, artifact that we dwell on to think through the destruction of, of Loyolo. And we then went and um, sought out Gladys Thomas, who was still alive, and who was moved from Simonstown to Ocean View. And our work took us to a series of conversations where Gladys Thomas um, could tell us a little bit more about um, Ocean View, about her work, about her um, her work with James Matthews. But what was what ended up, you know, being as the intervention was um, a kind of a speculation on the gladiolus flower, which is a local flower that, um, you know, grows indigenously on the slopes of, of, Cape, of Cape Town. And we wanted to pay homage to the gladiolus, which is actually a, means a small sword and then also trying to link it to these two figures, um, Gladys and Gundlandlu, the painter, and Gladys Thomas, um, the poet who wrote, um, who, wrote this, who wrote the poem in Cry Rage. Um, an image of some of the life in Luyolo. Most of the people in Luyolo were moved to Guguletu, um, and there is, in fact, in Guguletu, an area called Luyolo Stone made us also think about this painting by Gladys and Gundlandlo called The Fall. Um, and in fact, Kimang um, searched for this painting and um, uh, uh, bought it. And the idea was that how this painting really begins to talk about the expulsion out of paradise. Luyolo was, um, was located on a, uh, the road, Paradise Road. Um, so these, these kinds of discoveries or these kinds of um, specters that came out of the out of the, the archive and out of our conversations does not have, does not actually avoid irony you know it doesn't it, it, it is so drenched in irony um, that the settlement would be located right next to a place called Paradise Road so the poem that Gladys Thomas wrote writes is called Fall Tomorrow and it's called and it reads, don't sow a seed, don't paint a wall, for tomorrow it will all fall. Let the dog bark and howl, for tomorrow we will sleep in the dark. Let the cock crow, let the hen lay, for tomorrow there'll be a better day. Let the children chop trees, let them break, let the little devils run and take, for tomorrow they will fall. Don't sow a seed, don't um, paint a wall, for tomorrow the yellow monsters will fall. Gladys Thomas is one of those prolific writers um, who uh, not only wrote this poem, and this poem was written, and that's why I'm finding it difficult to read, because it was written on a moving train from Simonstown 
to um, to, to Weinberg, um, and it was written. Um, it was one of the first poems that she wrote um, as a response to the destruction that she was seeing. Um, so through these walks and epistolary exchanges between myself and people like Imam, we see the seeds of a landscape design project which considers the idea perhaps of planting gladiolus gardens that would pay homage to the various sites affected um, by the 1960s apartheid, apartheid forced removals, while at the same time um, paying homage and respect to the painter Gladys Landlu and Gladys Thomas, the people of Luyolo, um, and um, others that, were, that are still being affected by, by this destruction. I'm going to now just end off with one last um, project, um, and this is a project that is very new in the office. It's still percolating and it's still brewing. Um, it's not at all complete. None of these projects are actually complete. It's just these are speculations that have various iterations. But this particular project is um, a project that is located in the Northern Cape of um, the country of, of the Western, Northern Cape of South Africa, um, about seven hours drive from Cape Town. It is, um, uh, it is meant to be the first um, community center in South Africa. And maybe I'll just um, read. I first got to know the building because of this beautiful article that you see on the screen and um, published in International Architect magazine in 1985. And as a student, I fell in love with the composition of the forms, the allure of um, the scale and the semi-desert landscape, and then the incredibly refined sequence of spaces and volumes set out in the plans and sections. And later, in 1998, the artist Angela Buckland who published photos of this particular building called the Steinkopf Community Center in a publication called Blank Architecture, um, Apartheid and After. In her images, they are very evocative. It's a people, um, you know, they know, they, they are, it's mostly of people in front of the building and mostly of, um, there's one image of um, a pair of shoes hanging from a telephone pole. Um, the melancholic frame within which the buildings and people are captured intrigued me, as well as a single caption, caption which, which describes it as South Africa's first community building. The building is currently owned by the, the Macquarie municipality in the Northern Cape and is thus a building of public ownership. Um, it's also may, maybe worth noting that it was designed by um, one of South Africa's more um, global architects, a man called Rulof Eitenburghardt and um, uh, Norbert Rosendahl. And they had a company that designed very expressive buildings like this. And the, the building was commissioned by the Anglo-American Mining Company. And shortly after the building was completed in the 1980s, an anthropologist studied the circumstances around which the building was commissioned and constructed. Charles Carter um, found out that Anglo-American um, wanted to build this building um, as a way of um, giving something to the community of people that were essentially impoverished, impoverished by mining activities and um, other kind of industrial endeavors by big corporates. So it was a social development project. But what happened um, soon after um, the design was complete, um, it, was, it came out that there wasn't enough money to construct the building. Anglo-American refused to fund the project further and asked that the architects and the team look to the community to actually complete the construction of the building. One of the ways that they um, um, funded the building was to have competitions where um, you have a, a lotto um, and you could maybe win this particular car. 
just to backtrack a little bit, but this, the Nama community and the environment within which this building was um, constructed is a kind of a community that came, that is very much on, on the stronghold of missionary, religious, um, you know, um, basically what I call theolo theological terror. So the missionaries um, imposed a kind of a very, um, you know, very like um, orthodox religious um, rule. And one of the things that they, um, uh, that they, that the, the um, missionary communities forbode was they um, forbid people to dance in public spaces. Um, so the idea with dancing was um, a complete taboo um, in this particular com community. It was, it was considered to be unchristian. To which extent this taboo was um, resisted um, is obviously still up for debate. But it is within this context of a kind of a very religious, um, oppressive and um, commercially extractive environment that this building emerges and um, becomes a kind of a um, icon in the community. This is the a photograph of the actual building in its, in its state. But I've mentioned that one of the ways that they funded the building was to um, have lottos where you could win the car. But in the end, um, a deep irony um, emerges where they actually funded the building by having dance competitions. So this major taboo um, was in the end used to fund the completion of this building. In 2016, I went um, with a group of people, including um, Heinrich, who took this beautiful photograph, to see where this building is at, because um, we understood that it is a complete ruin in this neighborhood. Um, we found that this building um, is indeed a ruin in some ways. Um, the kind of um, normal things that buildings need is, is, is completely stripped. There are no um, electric, sanitary way, um, there's no uh, doors, for instance, windows are, um, are, are completely out. In some ways, it does represent a ruin, but in other ways, it represents a kind of a building with no walls, um, a kind of an open, porous space where all you have is this exquisite floor and an exquisite roof. Um, members of the community, um, in, in, in particular, a group of Rastafari, um, a collective, art collective, have taken ownership or custodianship of this building and populated it with various artworks that pay homage to Nama, uh, Nama leaders in the area. So our research project, um, our current research project centers around um, thinking carefully about whether this is a indeed maybe the ultimate community space where, where there are no real walls that enclose, all the walls basically support, um, and what could be the potential for that kind of space. These are some images from um, you know, the people that um, live around the space. We um, documented some of their memories um, and some of, the, um, some of their interactions with the building in its heyday in the 1970s. Um, where the building was seen as a kind of a, a, a space to celebrate big events, big, big milestones. Um, you'll see that the Bougainvillea becomes a kind of a key space, a key uh, motive in this, in this building. So this is a, an ongoing um, project of ours. Thank you for listening. I think um, I've tried to just think through the kind of um, idea that we have of continuing Flyke's tour of observation, um, but also kind of think through the potentialities of this tour of observation in establishing um, an emancipatory um, spatial practice. Thank you very much. <laughs>